Hey everyone again. Thank you once again for joining me. My name is Elizabeth Voss. I am Editor-in-Chief of Disobedient Media and I'm going to read to you uh, a special report that we published earlier uh, last year uh, titled The Truth Dies in Darkness, Dutroit. And it's a very long article. It's a very serious article. And uh, I may add a few um, ad libs as I go through this if I feel it's necessary because this is just a really um, intense article. So. I may add some, some thoughts that are not in the text. Um, I really, really appreciate everyone who's watching this. I am providing this content so that people can hear the articles as opposed to having to read them because I know a lot of people are rushed and don't have time. And so um, I'll just get right into it. The Dutro case is significant not only because of the deep state depravity of crimes committed and witnessed, but because of the evidence that emerges from the case and the fact that it's validated twice over first by legal proceedings, secondly by the publication of many of the prosecution's uh, records by WikiLeaks in 2009, the Dutro affair was further validated by the extreme suppression of evidence that, in what many have called a cover-up perpetrated by the Belgian establishment. The episode is a definitive example of the exposure of deep judicial and political corruption leading to widespread public distrust in the legitimacy of their institutions of government. This sentiment has been echoed most recently in the US, where many feel that the rule of law has come to mean little in the face of an utterly corrupt establishment that has become unaccountable to the public. Um, Belgium's Dutroux scandal set a terrible precedent for future investigations of child trafficking, murder, and pedophilia rings. However, it also set a precedent of mass public protest in response to such abuses, evident last year in South Korea's response to the scandal surrounding President Park, former President Park and her advisor, Choi Soon Sil. It took almost a decade for the Belgian legal system to convict Marc Dutroux for the mid-1990s kidnapping and rape of six girls, for four of whom were murdered. The case is infamous for an inexplicably high number of mysterious deaths, suppre suppression of evidence by the police, and numerous accounts from witnesses of extreme abuse perpetrated by a well-connected, violent pedophile ring. The case eventually prompted 300,000 Belgians to take to the streets in the White March. The Dutroux affair left such deep scars on the consciousness of the Belgian population that roughly one-third of Belgians who shared the surname Dutroux with the accused killer had their names legally changed. Despite the case having been uh, legally concluded, many years later it is apparent that numerous significant elements of the important case remain unresolved. And then there is an image of the White March, uh, if you read the article. Uh, the case began with the arrest of Marc Dutroux in 1996. Two of the four dead girls found on Marc Dutroux's properties had been buried alive after being wrapped in plastic. Two more girls died of starvation in a homemade underground dungeon while Dutroux served a brief prison sentence. Part of the public outcry regarding the handling of Dutroux's case stemmed from his previous convictions for similar rapes against young girls. Despite the nature of these crimes, Dutroux had been released early for good behavior, allowing him to reoffend. There is a lot of mishandling that goes on in this case, including uh, by police who didn't watch videotapes that would have revealed him uh, abusing young girls and building a dungeon. I'll get to that in a, in a moment. Media reports describe the victims having been kept in cages and a large amount of DNA evidence recovered from those cells were never analyzed by authorities despite the fact that this evidence may have revealed the identities of additional perpetrators. The defense regularly cited uh, DNA evidence indicating that other people have visited Dutro's cell alluding to the hundreds of human hairs that were never accounted for. And uh, in that last sentence, when I said the defense regularly cited DNA evidence, I'm specifically referring to Dutroux's defense counsel in his trial. So, adding to the botched nature of the case, police eventually admitted that they could have saved lives if they had watched videos confiscated from Dutroux's home, showing him constructing the dungeon where some of the girls died. Dutroux's lawyer commented in court on the failure to analyze the DNA evidence found in that basement cell where two of Dutroux's victims died. Can people really make you believe that there wasn't a pedophile ring, his lawyer said. We clearly, in the dossier material proof, 
Oh, sorry. I, I'm, I'm still quoting Dutro's lawyer. He says, we clearly see in the dossier material proof that other people than the accused were here in the, in the cell and frequented it regularly. Dutro's claims regarding help from the police appeared to have been corroborated by seven arrests in, uh, also relating to this case, including that of a police officer. So, uh, yeah, so Dutro was not the only person that was arrested in connection with this specific uh, ring or group of crimes. Dutro and his counsel consistently alleged that he had abducted and abused girls with police help as part of a child trafficking and abuse network connected to the elite of the Belgian establishment during his criminal proceedings. The claims were discussed by the Washington Post, who noted that the police had said Dutro was part of a child prostitution ring that may have also been responsible for sever several other disappearances that were still unsolved. They wrote that Dutro's gang had allegedly offered to buy young victims for $5,000 apiece. So this is the, you know, I just streamed about the Washington Post, but they reported this. This, this mainstream legacy media outlet reported that police had said Dutro was part of a child prostitution ring responsible for several other disappearances and that they offered to buy young victims for $5,000 apiece. Dutro also claimed that Belgian businessman Michael, Michel Nihul ha had been his accomplice and it was his link with a larger criminal enterprise. Nihul was charged in relation to the case with kidnapping, rape, conspiracy, and drug offenses, among a total of 13 people who were charged in connection with the Dutro case. Nihul was acquitted of charges connected to kidnapping but he was convicted of being part of a ring that trafficked drugs and people into Belgium. Nahul had expressed uh, confidence to the Guardian after charges were initially brought against him, saying that the case would never come to court because he had, quote, information about important people in Belgium that could bring the government down. During the interview, Nahul boasted, calling himself the monster of Belgium, his allusion to sexual blackmail material pr paralleled Marc Dutro's allegations during court proceedings that Nuhul was indeed connected to a network of powerful child abusers. According to the BBC investigators, uh, according to the BBC, investigators believe that Dutro and Nuhul were part of a larger human trafficking network. Uh, the BBC wrote, investigators believe that Dutro and Nuhul were planning a long distance prostitution trafficking network involving cars and the import of girls from Slo Slovakia. Fox News, rea uh, reaction, uh, Fox News wrote that the reaction of one of the mothers of Dutro's victims, uh, she said, this has confirmed what I thought, they worked together, the recognition of this is a relief. Nuhul's conviction for trafficking drugs and people begs the question as to who else may have been involved in the network. Nuhul's statement uh, that he could, quote, bring the government down, implied his criminal activities included ties to influential individuals, which echoed statements made by Marc Dutro. Witnesses in the case identified Nuhul as a violent figure that attended orgies where children were sexually abused, tortured, and sometimes killed, with members of the establishment present. The first judge in the case, Connor Rowe, believed Nuhul was the brains behind the operation, as reported by The Guardian. The Telegraph reported that Dutro's lawyers had alluded to horrific claims of a satanic cult involved with child sacrifice. And this is, again, this is um, Dutro's lawyers in, co in court claiming that, he, that the ring in general had been involved in child sacrifice. And there were over 800 mentions of Newhall in the WikiLeaks dossier on Dutro. Uh, which was published in 2009. The notes record the presence of a photo of New Hall with various political figures, as well as a statement by Dutro that, quote, New Hall proposed to, redu to reduce or traffic girls from Eastern countries. Um, and I I've looked through the translation, the English translation of the dossier, and it's incredible. Uh, and it has a lot of references to working with others in order to traffic girls and a lot of other... Um, really disturbing details. So descriptions of Dutro in the dossier include his request to help of help from his brother in pr pushing a car laden with bodies into a cana canal. The instance was one of many observations in the dossier and I'm referring here to the WikiLeaks dossier on uh, Dutro and please if you feel like it go look up the English translation of that dossier. 
and it's really, really um, eye-opening to read that. Um, so the instance was one of many observations in the dossier which strongly suggests that Dutroux and Newhall were involved in more crimes than those for which they were charged, and that there may have been additional unknown accomplices in these acts. That these political links were not that these potential links were not investigated fueled public outrage at the failure of the Belgian judicial process. In 2009, WikiLeaks provided further information regarding the case via their publication of the Dutroux dossier. Um, which later attempted unsuccess. Oh yeah, the Belgian government attempted unsuccessfully to force WikiLeaks to remove the dossier. The threats to sue WikiLeaks came amid the media firestorm in the wake of their publication of the Iraq War logs, when the revel and the revelation of U.S. military human rights abuses. WikiLeaks summarized the case, Dut saying that Dutroux was a figure in the European criminal underworld and the case has connections to other underworld figures, to police corruption, and from there to Belgian political figures. This case, then, is unique in having been documented twice over, first in a contorted legal record, and secondly by a publisher with a flawless record for accuracy. WikiLeaks Dutroux dossier also shows large financial transactions, maps of Euro numerous European countries, and the presence of an international of international currencies, including Moroccan and Saudi Arabian currency, the dossier shows payments of hundreds of thousands thousands of francs to Michelle Martin, who was Dutroux's wife at the time, and to Dutroux's personal bank account. It appears to be a reasonable inference from these documents that Marc Dutroux and Michelle Nuhall were not acting alone in their criminal enterprises. Much as, much as in the lack of analysis of DNA material recovered from Dutroux's basement, the lack of investigation into Marc Dutroux's financial connections increased frustration towards an appallingly inefficient legal procedure. This was especially glaring. Uh, it, this was an especially glaring oversight in line of the fact that Dutroux was an electrician living on social security benefits during the time of the crimes. But nonetheless, he owned 10 houses. The New York Times wrote on this point, and this is, again, this is the New York Times describing this. Quote, after several of the disappearances, Marc Dutroux, Mr. Dutroux, paid large sums of money into several bank accounts within four years of being released early from jail, where he had served time for rape and kidnapping. Mr. Dutroux, invest, uh, whose only official income was a welfare check, was worth an estimated 6 million francs, suggesting to investigators that he was acting for others higher up in a pedophile and prostitution ring. So again, I'm going to emphasize this, that was the New York Times describing the situation. I'm going to get back to the article. The investigation was also mired by an unusually high number of deaths in relation to the scandal. These included the son of a judge, police officers, and even the chief prosecutor overseeing the case. The Guardian reported on this point. Since Dutroux's arrest, 20 potential witnesses conducted in the ca uh, connected with the case have died in mysterious circumstances, fueling suspicions of a cover-up reaching the highest levels. The Guardian then added that important evidence had also disappeared. And I want to add um, that when I was researching this, the I researched the names and the circumstances of these deaths that are said by the Guardian to have surrounded Dutroux, uh, the Dutroux scandal. And these deaths were not, um, you know, normal deaths. They were, as the Guardian says, they were mysterious deaths. So, for example, um, you know, somebody being burnt to death in their bed or somebody being driven off a bridge. And so just if, if you look it up yourself, if you look at the, uh, the links that I've cited, you should be able to find some of the information on that. And it's really mind boggling the way that, that uh, unfolded. So back to the article. Uh, the New York Times reported in, on the death specifically of Hubert Massa, who served as the chief prosecuting attorney in Liege and was in charge of the investigation into the alleged pedophile murders committed by Marc Dutroux. Massa was also the lead investigator into the 1991 gangland-style gangland slaying of André Cools, the Socialist Party boss in Wallonia. Massa's death during the Dutroux case was termed a suicide by his superior Anne Tilly, the main suspect in the Cools case, also committed suicide. So, I want to 
uh, break that down a little bit as a side note. Hubert Massa is the chief prosecutor in the Dutro case, and he's also overseeing a uh, corruption, gangland uh, type of murder. So there are two major cases he is uh, overseeing, and then he allegedly commits suicide in his office. Re uh, back to the article. Revelations of corruption resulting from Kuhl's death led to the disgrace of Willie Clays, who was a Belgian statesman and Secretary General of NATO. Clays resigned from his leadership position at NATO after he was found guilty of corruption. The witness in the Dutro investigation, also uh, known as X3, further identified Willie Clays as one of those present during alleged torture, sexual, sexual abuse, and murder of children. The Washington Post further speculated that there may have been a connection between the Cools case and that of Dutro. <sighs> the New York Times reported on the death of the son of a police officer involved with the investigation into, into Dutro. Quote, and this is again from the New York Times, Judge Poncelet's son, a police officer, was involved in another case in which Mr. Dutro was implicated. He was investigating the trafficking of stolen cars in 1996 when he was shot and killed in an unsolved murder. The Irish Times and other media noted strange deaths among witnesses tied to the Dutro case, describing how Bruno Tagliaferro, a scrap merchant who planned to testify against Dutro, was poisoned and his wife burned to death in her bed. A sex club owner associated with New Hall was also shot to death. So these are not um, natural deaths. These are being these are poisonings. These are burnings, and this is uh, outright shootings. So um, in a lot of these cases, it's not even a pretense of of alleged suicide. It's just um, an unsolved murder. Uh, oh, back to the article. Uh, John Van Pettigem was yet another death associated with the investigation. He had spoken to authorities regarding involvement with Mark Dutro, so he basically was admitting that he had been involved with Dutro. According to European reports, uh, John Van Pettigem died when his moped crashed into a bus. Uh, Dutro also admitted murdering an accomplice, a further accomplice named Bernard Weinstein. The many deaths surrounding the Dutro scandal uh, fueled concerns that Dutro was part of a larger pedophile network that had gone unpunished. So, despite these allegations, there were some who stood out as beacons of hope in the mind of Bel in the mind of the Belgian populace. Judge Connero, the original ju uh, judge in the Dutro investigation, was widely perceived as a hero in Belgium because his actions has re had resulted in the release of two girls: Sabine Darden, who was twelve, and Letitia Delhez, who was fourteen from Dutro's dungeon. The Telegraph reported that Sabine had been chained by the neck for 79 days and raped repeatedly. Despite having saved Sabine and Letitia, Conoro was removed from the case by the Belgian judiciary for what was labelled as a conflict of interest after he shared a meal at a fundraiser for the victim's families. So, again, I just want to make this very clear. Conoro was removed after he he shared a meal at a fundraiser for the victim's families. He is, uh, Judge Connero was also the only reason that those two girls were saved from Dutro's dungeon uh, and were found alive. He is the one that was responsible for the action that was taken in the case. And that is why the Belgian people admired him so much and that's why the White March uh, the, the protests that were known as the White March resulted from Conero's removal from the case by the Belgian ju judiciary, because many uh, many Belgians felt that when Conero was removed, that signified the complete end of investigation into the scandal, and they were absolutely fed up at the the failure of the rule of law in their country. But returning to the article, statements made by the well-loved judge in the wake of his removal also provided additional indications of deep corruption connected to organized child uh, trafficking, rape, and murder of children. Media reports described Conroe's statements in court where he had said a high-level murder plot stopped his investigation into a child sex mafia. So he basically said that he had been targeted 
and that it was because of this particular ring and its connections to um, establishment figures. Conroy further discredited, uh, described his belief that mafia groups had, had seized control of the key institutions of the country. Conroy discussed the information, which was later published by WikiLeaks, saying, okay, and what I'm what I meant to get across there is that Conoro discussed the, the dossier, which is eventually published by WikiLeaks. Uh, Conoro said of that dossier, the file talks of seizure, seizure of children, foreign trafficking, and perhaps even of cells. The sum of 150,000 francs or 2,500 pounds was mentioned as the price for girls. I was struck by the richness of these documents. And that's the end of the quote from Conoro. On that topic. That the well-linked, the well-liked judge responsible for the release of Dutroux's only surviving victims would make such explosive statements regarding the case illustrates the seriousness of the corruption surrounding the scandal and explains the degree to which the Belgian public was affected by such stark revelations of Dutroux's crimes as well as the procedural abuses which had allowed him to commit them with near impunity and which failed to investigate his alleged accomplices. Adding to, the public, adding to public frustration was the revelation that another judge in the case, Van Espen, had personal ties to Michael Michel Nuhul. So despite this clear conflict of interest, Van Espen did not resign from the case until his relationship with Nuhul was publicly revealed in 1998. Uh, years into the investigation, The Guardian reported that as a lawyer, Van Espen had represented Nuhul's wife, even more alarmingly, Van Espen's sister was the godmother of Nahul's child. Despite this, the Guardian wrote, Van Espen saw no conflict of interest, did not recuse himself, and was not removed from the case until the connections were made public. That Conoro was removed while Van Espen was allowed to remain on the case was yet another source of the ire for the Belgian populace. This corruption was yet again exposed when Mr. V uh, Verwil Verwilgen, the chairman of the parliamentary inquiry into the Dutro case, reported attempts to stifle their investigation into how, chill the, into how the case had been handled. Mr. Verwil Verwilgen was considered a highly respected individual when he served as chairman and eventually published a book which claimed that the commission's findings were muzzled by political and judicial leaders to prevent the revelations of, of details which would have implicated the complicity of additional perpetrators. The allegations of corruption and abuse made by the initial judge in the Dutro case would be corroborated by the chair of the parliamentary inquiry into the botched case suggests some extent, to some extent, the depth of corruption surrounding the investigation. The case was so deeply mishandled that it was reported to have inspired a complete crisis of public confidence in the Belgian government. René Michaud, a police officer, was principally noted to have epitomized the mishandling of the case. Michaud had failed to properly analyze videotapes which were confiscated from Dutroux that would have revealed his involvement in rape and constructing cells which the kidnapped girls, in which the kidnapped girls were kept. Hundreds of the tapes were not processed. Some of them were even returned to Dutroux. Michel was additionally condemned in the eyes of the public for having ignored the sound of children screaming for when he visited Dutroux's home. Belgian police admitted that this inaction resulted in the deaths of two of Dutroux's victims. Despite such complete incompetence, Marchot not only was not fired and not punished, he received a promotion to the position of police commissioner before his death in 2009. Marchot's promotion was viewed by many in Belgium to have implied reward for compliance in a deeply corrupt legal system that simultaneously punished those who acted on behalf of victims, as had Judge Conoro. Now oh, my throat is so dry right now. Corruption, uh, corrupted alleg corruption allegations were further fueled by the words of Anne Tilly, the Prosecutor General of Liege, who claimed bodies recovered from Dutroux's property were too decomposed to perform DNA analysis. However, the BBC reported that, autopsies, that the autopsy of the victims stated quite clearly that the bodies were not decomposed. Samples were taken. 
It is just that no one seems to know what happened to the results. Why were the hairs which detectives gathered from the dungeon in Dutro's cellar never sent to DNA analysis? This blatantly corrupt or incompetent process increased the gall with which, with which the case was perceived by the Belgian public. Numerous women, codenamed ex-witnesses, spoke to investigators working on the Dutro case, claiming to have suffered horrific abuses at the hands of a criminal network linked to Dutro and New Hall, which had abused children in order to blackmail members of the Belgian establishment. According to the BBC, the ex-witnesses placed New Hall and Dutro at the scene of torture, rape and murder of multiple children, along with other elite figures. Nahul was also accused of producing snuff films. Uh, the number of witnesses eventually reached uh, to X9, according to the BBC documentary on the case. And I want uh, to step out of the article for one moment and say and mention another parallel to the article that we discussed, that we uh, at Disobedient Media published later, much, uh, months after this report was published. Um, which was about uh, Greg Buccheroni's claims of a, a, an organized child abuse ring. And uh, Greg also alleges that, uh, that snuff films were being produced by the East Coast Trafficking Network and that he witnessed uh, some of these snuff films. So this is an allegation that parallels other allegations and it's yet another parallel to the, to the, between the various establishment trafficking ring cases. Back to the article. Um, the New York Times reported on the book The X-Files, what Belgium was not supposed to know about the Dutro affair, which was extensive, which extensively documented the ex-witness testimony. The New York Times wrote, quote, the book draws copiously from police files, transcripts of the ex-witness's evidence, and the findings of a parliamentary commission and other sources. Even if the way the ex-witnesses testified seemed irrational, the authors say many of the facts they described stand up to scrutiny. The first and most well-known victim to come forward was codenamed X1. Her real identity was later revealed in the press as Regina Loof. The BBC described Loof's testimony. It was, and this is her testimony, quote, It was big business, blackmail. There was a lot of money involved, ses and sessions were secretly filmed without the client's knowledge. That's the end of that quote. The Guardian described Luth's haunting allegations. Another quote. The entertainment was not just sex. It involved sadism, torture, and even murder. And again, she described places, the victims, and the way that they were killed. One of the regular organizers of these parties, she claimed, was the man she knew as Mitch, Jean-Michel Nihul. Quote, a very cruel man. He abused children in a very sadistic way, she said. And there, also there, she said, was the young Dutro. And that was, all of that preceding paragraph was a quote from the Guardian's coverage of this case. The New York Times also noted that Luf spoke of having been sold into prostitution by her grandmother and later introduced to a circle of orgies at which she had seen young children tortured and murdered. The other ex-witnesses, one of whom worked for the police, told similar stories of childhood abuse and described hunts at which children were chased through the woods with Dobermans. Mr. DeBeats had each of Luth's statements checked out and discovered that she in inexplicably had detailed knowledge of the unsolved murder of two young women in the 1980s that appeared to support this thesis of a conspiracy theory. That was a quote from the New York Times. As discussed by the New York Times, Luf's testimony was rewarded, uh, regarded as remarkably accurate to the point that she was able to correctly describe the scene of an unsolved murder. The BBC reported that Luf's test detailed testimony had included details of names and locations where members of the establishment engaged in violent orgies with children. Luf alleged that Michelle Newhall was a regular participant, and she also claimed that children had been, yeah, I've said that before, so I'll just... Skip that. The Guardian described Luth to accuracy. At least one of the murders she described matched an unsolved case. What Luth had described was a macabre torture which eventually killed a 15-year-old girl she knew as Chrissy. It was a sort of bondage, she told me. So, And this is a quote from, from Luth that The Guardian describes. 
Um, it was a sort of bondage, so her legs would, and her hands and her throat were connected by the same rope, and so when she moved, she strangled herself. And at this very um, horrific point in the article, I just want to sidestep out, because I'm not sure if I um, made the point strong enough that what she described actually matched up with an unsolved murder. And not only did the description of the, the, the method of killing match with the murder, but also the location matched a specifically odd location on the inside of a building that was um, really irregularly made. And so you wouldn't have been able to describe that building unless you had been inside it. And she, she perfectly described it. So actually, I think that in the next paragraph, I discussed that. I said, I wrote, Further verifying the veracity of Luth's description, the Guardian wrote that the scene of the murder she claimed to have witnessed occurred in an underground mushroom farm. The report states that the son of the former owner of the location had stated, quote, I never met Regina Luth. All I know is that she could not have described the house as well as she did unless she'd been there. It would be impossible to invent it. Luth struggled to speak out on the horrific abuses she claimed to have experienced and witnessed, ultimately failed. Investigators who believed her testimony to be credible were removed from the investigation and her real identity was linked to the, leaked to the press. So, uh, Regina was believed by the police that were initially investigating her claims. Her claims were backed up by evidence and by real murders that matched what she stated happened. And then, uh, as the investigation continued, those police officers that believed her testimony were replaced by a second set of officers who then destroyed her credibility by calling her crazy. And they, I, I believe they fired all of the people that had believed her. But anyway, after I, uh, the rest of the article uh, is... Uh, goes like this. After Luth's identity was made public, her reputation was systematically destroyed. The BBC wrote that after her identity became known, a government-owned TV station, uh, RTBF, began a campaign designed to prove that Dutro was an isolated pervert, kidnapping girls for only himself, that there was no network, that Jean-Michel Nihul was innocent, and that Regina Luth was a liar. At this point, the public effectively gave up struggling to find real justice for Dutro's victims. To protest systemic corruption was to be associated with insanity, and so outrage was morphed by shame into heavy silence. The removal of Connor Road from the case served as a final outrage for the Belgian populace, which provoked 300,000 citizens to take to the street in the protest known as the White March. Protesters were peaceful, wearing white in solidarity with the victims and in recognition of the alleged cover-up protecting establishment figures from prosecution. Despite this, no progress was ever made into the invest in the investigation of crimes related to the Dutro case and calls for transparency went unanswered. In the end, the only answer to the known and unknown victims of Dutro was the same, a resounding silence. And that is the end of that article. It's a really, really heavy article. There's a lot of source links. Um, and I thought it was, as I was investigating this, I thought it was amazing that so many, um, you know, what I often in my own writing call establishment press, legacy media, and, you know, outlets that I see as, as heavily, you know, compromised by interest in America seemed to, you know, they reported on the most... Um, off the wall horrific aspects of this case. They, you know, you have the New York Times and uh, the Washington Post reporting on this, and they were reporting even the mysterious deaths that came that were related to this case. So, I think that it's a really important story, and um, I think it just it just needs to be uh, it needs to receive more attention than it has. Just like the NGO stories that I previously read this evening. And I will just check chat one second, but um, thank you so much for joining me. Again, my name is Elizabeth Boss. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Disobedient Media. You can find me on Twitter at Elizabeth Lee Voss, and that's L-E-A-V-O-S. You can find Disobedient Media at Disobedient News on Twitter. And please visit our website. Check out these articles that we've written and that I'm reading because um, the source links that I cite have 
infinitely more information than I can fit into one article. And so, um, but I really appreciate you listening and taking the time to join me in, in uh, shedding light on some really, really dark stories that have been, um, as I said in the article, silenced, unfortunately. And I will continue to stream my articles at a later date. I think I'm done for the evening. But, um, you know, I will try to stream the articles that are relevant um, outside of a time frame. So if it's something like, you know, breaking the DNC fraud lawsuit is dismissed, which is no longer relevant or timely, I'm not going to stream that. But I'll stream general articles like um, the fact that the DNC fraud lawsuit brings up questions about Troll Lucas's death and that type of thing. So I hope that you will join me when I stream in future, and thank you so much for joining me this evening.